and welcome to the 495. I'm your host, Doug Sparks, Editor-in-Chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. This is a first today because we're pre-recording the interview. It's actually Sunday, June 7th, but if you're watching this uh, as it debuts, it's going to be on, on Wednesday. So we're up early morning. Lou, is my hair okay? Yes. <laughs> I know it's I know it's early in the morning. Your hair's I, okay. I, I, I tried to do my best. I don't know if the best I'm the best guy to be asking, but yes, your hair's okay. I, I trust you. I trust <laughs> you. Um, and the reason why we're pre recording this uh, will become clear as as we begin to speak with our, our guest because he is a is a busy guy. Um, he's a blogger. He's an historian. He's the founder of Lowell Walks. If you ever see the uh, have been to the history uh, walking tours in Lowell uh, maybe you've seen him, and he's been the Register of Deeds in Lowell since 1995. Uh, Richard, can you hear me? I can. So I, I actually want to dive, since you're an, an historian, I want to dive right away into history. And I want to go back to 2003, when when Howard Dean was was unexpectedly doing well uh, in the polls when he was running for president. Um, what was happening then, and how did it inspire what came later with your own blogging? Well, that, I've always pointed to that as the catalyst for me getting into blogging. And uh, one of the reasons was my entire life, um, I've, I've been very interested, I guess, in communications, how, how um, people communicate with one another, how institutions communicate with the public, and the effectiveness of each. And um, I, somewhere along the lines, I developed a reasonable aptitude with technology, especially for somebody in my age cohort. Uh, and what fascinated me about the Howard Dean campaign, it was in November and December of 2003, was this uh, little known governor of one of the smallest states in America just surged to the top of the field of the Democratic candidates for president for the, it would have been the November 2004 election. And so as I tried to dissect what it was that, uh, helped his success, um, I found that uh, a blog was a big part of it. I think the title of it was Blog for America. Um, and it not only was the, the blog itself, but it was um, using, uh, using online technology tools as a method of organizing people on the ground. And I think they used Meetup as a uh, uh, as a way to get people this is i remember reading an account of uh um, i think it was it, it's a book by uh, dean's campaign manager joe trippy and he said they had a, an event scheduled somewhere in new york city and uh, they expected a couple hundred people to come and as they drove uh, towards the venue um, there were people all over the streets and he was like oh no what's going on this will just make it hard for people to get to our event and it turned out it was the line that had formed to get into their event. And it was thousands and thousands of people. And that's what Trippy, it, like he says, the switch went off in his head that this is very powerful. So anyway, uh, uh, I, given my longstanding interest in communications and how you reach people, um, th this sort of like said, oh, this is a tool that's uh, potentially very valuable and so uh, you should check it out and so that sort of launched my career as a blogger yeah what was the um you, you know sometimes people forget they forget what the internet was like back then so when did the blog start and what was the internet like back then how is it different from today well the the richardhow.com blog didn't launch until 2007 my first one, which still actually exists, it, it came out of the Registry of Deeds, and it's called Lowell Deeds. Um, it, the registry website is lowelldeeds.com, and there's still a blog there. Uh, and uh, it, it, it sort of it was an interesting experiment because th there's sort of limits on how to make real estate interesting, and that's the kind of stuff I was writing about. But it was also bringing in uh, popular culture and things like that. Um, and I had my own website as a, as a political candidate because Registered Deeds is an elected office. It was richardhow.com, but it was just a static site. And it was um, on the occasion of Marty Meehan, who was then the congressman in the 5th Congressional District, the area that included Lowell, he announced in March of 2007 that he 
was going to resign from Congress to become the chancellor at UMass Lowell. And that triggered a, uh, a special congressional election. And I thought, uh, this is the only congressional election going on in America at the time. It was a time of intense interest in politics. And I thought, well, this seems like a good opportunity to launch a, a political blog that covers this race. And that's, that's where Richard Howe came from, richardhowe.com came from. Um, and I think what's noteworthy about that time is there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no such thing as social media. Um, and so uh, I've often said that blog gears are a lot like dog gears. <laughs> There's a lot that happens in a very short period of time. And so um, with the richardhow.com site having been born in 2007 and still going today, it, it's probably one of the longest uh, continuously active blogs, certainly in this region. Yeah. Do you remember what the first post was? Um, I think it was probably something announcing uh, what we were doing and, and uh, what, what the site was, but I, I don't off the... Um, the top of my head. So um, and I think you mentioned this in the, I'm holding right in my hands, History as it, as it Happens, which is a book you edited with Paul Marion. Uh, and it's a, um, it's excerpts in, in, well, it's blog posts since the beginning. Um, you mentioned the introduction that when you first started this, there were a lot of citizen blogs and there was, there was a lot of activity and a lot of that is, has faded over time, but you've persevered. Why did the blog culture seem to lose steam over time? Uh, well, you you rightly uh, point out from from the introduction that when I launched it in 2007, I think there were maybe close to a dozen other blogs in Lowell itself that were uh, written and maintained by local, mostly activists. And uh, it, it really had a... Uh, a destabilizing influence on the power structure in Lowell because up until then, the political power kind of um, went through the local newspaper, the Lowell Sun. And then there were two radio stations, WCAP and WLLH. So, and they had a certain amount of influence. But then kind of the inside view was phone calls uh, from person to person and meetings at coffee shops. And, and there was sort of like a lot of insiders that were spreading gossip and analysis. Um, and some of it filtered into the newspaper, but it was mostly an inside game. Now, suddenly you've got everybody with a, a computer and an internet connection is sharing their opinion on politics. So, uh, and the politicians who really only had to curry favor with the newspaper reporters and publishers and editors. Now, all of a sudden, they had these obscure citizens that nobody knew weighing in and sharing their uh, their opinions. Um, and so that's the power of the blogs. I think what happened, why there aren't that many left, is it's hard work. And to do it, you have to be persistent. You just can't randomly every six weeks post something because nobody's going to find it and and so i think because none of these people were doing it as a business they were all doing it as as an avocation or a hobby uh, that life intervened and then i think at the same time social media came along and a lot of the local comments and uh, commentary that you saw on blogs in 2007 say to 2009 has now migrated onto Facebook. Yeah, so um, raise a number of questions. The first is, of course, like where do you get your, your energy? Did, did, did you have parents who instilled in you a hard work ethic? Like why, and you're, you're also doing these walking tours in Lowell. Where does that come from? Where does that drive come from? Well, I, I think a commitment to public service was ingrained in me from uh, early on. My, my dad was actually elected to the Lowell City Council in 1965 when I was uh, seven years old. And then he served 40 consecutive years on the city council. He was elected to 20 consecutive terms. And uh, in four of those terms, he was selected to be mayor by his colleagues. So from the time I was seven years old to the time I was 47, uh, my dad was a city councilor, and so public events became the 
uh, dinner table conversation in my house every every night and every Sunday. So that just was a natural thing. Um, and as for my, my commi time commitment, um, I practiced law with my dad for about eight years from 1986 when I graduated from law school till 95 when I took office as registered deeds. And uh, being a lawyer in private practice is probably closer to a 70 hour a week job than a 40 hour a week job. So um, when I became elected registered deeds and uh, it was a 40 hour a week job, uh, all of a sudden I had 30 hours to, <laughs> available to fill up. And um, I don't golf and I don't ski and uh, I don't have a <laughs> house at the beach or at the mountains. So uh, I'm around and uh, I enjoy being active in the community and and that's kind of where that comes from. So the other thing that, uh, you know, from, from what you mentioned that I wanted to ask you about is the way the Internet has changed as a whole since then, because you talked about the rise of social media. I mean, there's this, also this idea that that Internet, uh, you know, when when the blog first started and before going back to the 90s was was more of a wild west. There were a lot more more, you know, just, there was just a lot more kind of strange stuff. And then it uh, something changed at some point. And um, it was became a lot more centralized and there was a lot more money involved. Uh, do you think about this and do you think about the way that the change in the Internet has shaped political discourse? Yeah, and I think uh, I think very pessimistically about it, to um, to be honest with you, uh, I, I think because of my interest in technology and my interest in history, uh, I, I am very interested in the history of technology and how it changes society. And I was struck by uh, uh, a quote by uh, a guy named Clay Shirky, S-H-I-R-K-Y, who was a professor at uh, NYU, New York University, who I quote him in my uh, in, in the History As It Happens book. Uh, and, and he said that when uh, a, a destabilizing technology, something like the printing press, say, is first invented, um, it takes sometimes even a century for society to figure out how to best use it. So the printing press came along, and yeah, they were, but they were basically doing mechanically what they had been doing by hand before then, and they really didn't understand what the implications of it were. And so Shirky says that when a new technology comes along, there's this period of intense experimentation uh, until society figures out how to best use it. And I think that's kind of the Wild West that you describe from uh, maybe 10 to 20 years ago. Uh, but then I think what happened was uh, kind of corporate America stepped in, in the form of Facebook primarily, but also Twitter. And um, using computer programming, um, you know, it's like the more eyeballs, the more you can um, charge people to advertise on the site. And uh, human nature is such that people don't um, gravitate to the calm, uh, insightful, uh, long form uh, pieces. They go to, uh, you know, the if, if it bleeds, it leads, which has always been kind of a buzzword in journalism. And I think that uh, I think the, the mechanism that runs the major social media platforms rewards outrageousness and, and rewards extremism. And I think because that's just sort of in our DNA to be attracted to that kind of stuff, that's why that gets all the eyeballs. So it's almost like um, we have to uh, almost teach people kind of a, not only media literacy, but understand how that they're being manipulated by these online platforms, really for, for the, the financial benefit of these online platforms. Uh, do you think about podcasting? What do you think about podcasting? Do you listen to any podcasts? Um, I, I think podcasting is great. And I've, I've listened to yours a, a, a couple of times. And I, I I almost want to get into that because I, th I think it's another great communications tool, but uh, I don't listen to any because um, I find it hard to carve out the time. I, I have, I'm fortunate to have a five minute commute to work. So uh, that sort of eliminates that. Uh, and 
when I'm when I have free time, I'm either writing or reading, and I find that um, it's hard to con con it's hard to write while you're trying to understand what somebody's talking about. Um, so, yeah, it's almost like personal to me. I just haven't found a niche in my life to fit that into. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's a big problem, and it's a big uh, a big asset because a lot of people do have long commutes, and it gives them a chance to listen to something that's maybe more thoughtful or. Uh, contemplative or where you can really kind of dig in and provide long form answers to to these sorts of questions just out of curiosity when you read you say you like to read in your spare time are you reading through a like a digital device or are you reading print i'm reading print mostly but it's not because i dislike digital devices it's because uh, i just have a lot of books i think that um uh the default setting when people think to buy me a gift is a book, which I think is great because I, I love books. I love physical books. Uh, but when you have a big stack of books next to your next to your bed, uh, I sort of think, OK, I, I need to read these. And um, I've uh, I've read many things. I use an iPad for um, a digital device. I've read um, many books on it. And I enjoy reading them on it, so I'm not averse to that. Um, my wife, who is a, a huge reader, um, has a Kindle that um, she just downloads book after book after book. And I, I mean, she's reading constantly. She and unfortunately, I read nonfiction and she reads fiction, so we can't like double up on these books. Um, but I'm the one that actually pays the bills, and I I don't I don't see how much she's actually reading until we get the credit card bill at the <laughs> end of the month. But um, uh, so I mean, she'd be a good case study for somebody that wanted to get into electronic publishing. Hmm. So uh, going back to the blog, uh, I'm I was flipping through this today. A lot of people have written for this. So who has written for RichardHow.com? Uh, names people might recognize, and what are the what are the high points? What were the posts that really um, ignited uh, controversy or discussion or made something happen, made some sort of change happen in the low political landscape? Uh, well, to get to the, the first question, we it started with just me. And then uh, I had a friend named Tony Accardi who had similar interests. So he joined in and uh, another person named Marie Sweeney, who's uh, best known as a democratic political activist from Tewksbury. And then the fourth of our, our core group was Paul Marion, who you've had on before. He's the co-editor of that. He's the founder of Loom Press Publishing. He's a poet. He's got a number of books out. Uh, and so the four of us uh, kind of co-wrote the blog for most of the time. Um, now it's predominantly Paul and I. And I think all of us reached out to our various networks to invite people to join. Um, that's partly because it's tough to do it yourself. It's tough to come up with something to write about every day. Um, but also, uh, we wanted to kind of bring a variety of voices to, to the blog. And we're still open to uh, to people sharing stories. If anybody checks it out and they're, they're kind of a, a writer on their own or a poet and they have something they think they'd like to see published on the platform, they should just use the email address on richardhow.com and send uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to consider it. Now, as to notable posts, uh, there's one I, I always go back to uh, th that really was instructive to me. And I'll tell you the title and let you guess what it was about. The title was Red or Gray. Red or gray. Hmm. <laughs> and it's not about fishing. No. Uh, you got anything? Don't know. What was it? It was about corned beef. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Controversial. It, it was right before <laughs> uh, St. Patrick's Day. And that was just the title. It was, it, and I think um, I talked about, I have a preference for the gray type of corned beef. Not that I'm a connoisseur of it um but it it yielded um maybe 40 or 50 um uh comments and by the time people were sharing recipes for irish soda bread and yep. um getting into the the background of how why one corned beef is one color and one's the other 
It's and, the Irish equivalent of salsa gravy. <laughs> it's the same discussion. <laughs> well, and, and what that taught me was that you really can't predict what is going to resonate with people. And, and so, uh, as I, I say in the book, it's like, I've always seen this as a period of experimentation. It's an ongoing experiment. What is it that connects to people? Um, and that was an example of it. Uh, some of the kind of more, um, maybe more serious blog posts had to do with local politics in Lowell, where uh, I maybe took a stand on, uh, on some political issues that, that rattled, rattled some people. And, and uh, kind of interestingly, the thing that rattled the most was just quoting their own words back, back to them. Uh, one thing I did for maybe four or five years was uh, I used to transcribe the Lowell City Council meetings in real time. Um, I've long said that perhaps the most valuable course I've taken throughout my entire education was freshman year in high school when I took typing. And that was back even before electronic electric typewriters. But I could type 60 words a minute. And, and at the time, I didn't know that the keyboard was going to revolutionize the way the world worked as it has now. Uh, so I'm a very fast typist. And what I would do is I would tune into the cable broadcast of the Lowell City Council meetings. And as counselors talked, I would just basically transcribe like a court stenographer what they were saying. And as soon as it was over, I would post it on the blog. And um, so many people that didn't have the time to watch the meetings would just read through the transcripts. And, and they'd be like, I can't believe this counselor said that. I can't believe this. Where that comment otherwise would have like drifted off into the uh, ethernet and, and not be paid attention by to anybody. But uh, all of a sudden now it was uh, memorialized in, in digital print forever. Um, and so I, I think that had a very, uh, uh, I think that had a powerful effect on local politics and also on the community. It gave the community um, uh, an easier way to monitor what their elected officials were doing. You know, we, we live in such a, a divisive time politically. Do you, do you ever, like, worry about your own safety? Do you ever feel like you don't want to get into the political fray and write about it just because you, you don't want to have to bore, worry about some wacko doing something stupid? Um, I, I really have... That hasn't been the case. Um, I, I think that um, I try to bring... Um, kind of a maybe a more moderate approach to what I'm writing. What I'm writing isn't moderate, but um, I think I, I try to write, <laughs> you know, it, when I, one of my first days in law school, uh, the, the teacher said, you, you know, your job as a lawyer is to uh, think in advance about what it's going to be like when the, you know, what hits the fan. And, so I think I've been trained to think down the road that if you write something that's really inflammatory, how are you, how are you going to explain that a year from now or two years from now when the passion of the time dissipates? So I've not worried about uh, my physical safety. What I have worried about, and it's caused me to avoid certain topics, is um, kind of people who uh, people in power who have uh, uh, maybe would not would be offended be, by something I write kind of extracting revenge on people who might be close to me not so much to me I, I'm an elected official so it's up to the citizens of the 10 towns I represent whether or not I keep my job and they've re-elected me each time um, but there's others who I think would be innocent victims and politics can be a tough tough game and uh, you know a way to get to a, a political figure is through people who uh, he or she cares about so um, if there's something I thought that would put somebody close to me in an awkward or a position I've probably avoided that yeah so what's happening with the blog now I hear there's some changes in the works for uh, for 2020 right what um, it's partly uh, I at some point I stopped transcribing city council meetings because uh, that would take maybe three hours every Tuesday night. And um, it, 
it was just tough to sustain and it was tough to um it was tough to maintain the level of intensity of focusing on local politics that was really required to provide good coverage of local politics but so i was ready to move on to something different and um i think influenced partly by Paul Marion and his interest in literature and publish, publishing, and my own understanding that Lowell has a great literary tradition that I think is often um, not, it, it's not given enough credit for that literary tradition. It could be because so much of the focus is on the mills because of the National Park. Um, and I think there's a lot of great writers writing now in Lowell. Um, that we kind of jointly decided that we wanted to make more effort in highlighting the work of both current writers and past writers. So I wouldn't call it a, it's morphed into a literary magazine, but um, it it's more, we're writing, we're including more stories, poems, um, cultural posts, things like that. And our uh, geographic focus has really expanded. We now have this, um, a feature on every Friday. There's some Lowell-based writers who have connections in Ireland, uh, and we've sort of seeded Friday to this group, and they've they've called it Trana, T R A S N A. Uh, I think it means discovery in Gaelic, but uh, they have writers from Ireland and all over America contributing. So. Our, our reach, we, I changed the tagline from richardhow.com politics and history of Lowell to um, voices from Lowell and beyond to um, kind of signal that we were reaching out beyond just the city. Yeah. So uh, tell me about Lowell Walks. Tell me about the history. Tell me about some of the things that people might learn about if they participate in Lowell Walks. And also let me know uh, what you've been doing, what Lowell Walks has been doing during the pandemic when people can't congregate in big crowds? Well, Lowell Walks um, launched in 2015. So for about maybe five or six years before that, I had been given guided tours of Lowell Cemetery, which is a historic garden style cemetery in Lowell. If you're familiar with Lowell, it's right behind Shed Park in the Belvedere neighborhood. And it's kind of modeled on Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. So this is a beautiful place. It's got uh, monuments that would be considered works of art if they were in a, a sculpture um, museum. Um, and and there had been a long tradition of tours of these. So uh, I would give these tours a couple in the fall and a couple in the spring. And they, they'd routinely attract 80 or 90 people. So I knew there was a market for this sort of in-person group walking tour and at the time um, the city of Lowell was struggling with how to get people into downtown Lowell businesses were having a tough time of it because there just weren't enough people going there and so I thought well maybe I can make a contribution by uh, developing this series of Saturday morning walks uh, that uh, would run from uh, 10 a.m. to 11 30 90 minutes every Saturday during the summer and that, that would bring some people in. And when the walk was over, I'd invite them to go have a sandwich at a local restaurant or go shop in a local store. So I recruited a number of people with subject matter expertise to lead the tours. I, I led a few. Um, Paul and his wife, Rosemary Noon, led one on public art in Lowell. Uh, I had a, a captain of the Lowell Fire Department who was sort of the departmental historian, led one on major fires in Lowell, just that kind of thing. And so we scheduled the first one on maybe the first Saturday in June in 2015, and we had 80 people show up. And it was overwhelming because I had expected maybe 20. And uh, since then, we've averaged 100 people per walk. Uh, and that's over the course of uh, you know, four or five years. Yeah. So uh, I just want to jump in for one second. O over a hundred people on the walk. Is are these free? These tours? Yeah, they're free. What uh, I think. I think some of the keys to the success is the 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 uh, the threshold to participation is very low. That. You just have to show up. You don't have to register in advance. We don't try to collect people's email address. 
um, all the things that would be rational to do if you were running this sort of as a, as a business model uh, is just show up. And it's sort of become a big social event that, that we've got, it, and it's not the same 100 people. There's probably, I would say, five or 600 who are regulars who have shown up for maybe four or more walks. Um, but I know there was, a, there was this group of three women who they would meet earlier, go to breakfast somewhere, and then they would show up for the walk. That was sort of their social activity for the weekend. Um, and they're free. They start every Saturday. They start from the same place, the National Park Visitor Center in downtown Lowell. So it's like you wake up on Saturday morning, you decide you don't have anything to do, you show up for the walk. If you decide you have something to do, you know that, well, if I go next week, there'll be another walk. Yeah. What are the logistics of, of bringing a group of 100 people through the streets of Lowell? Well, that's tough. And, and that's a big part of it. So you not only have to think about what you're going to say, but... Uh, you know, street crossing is definitely uh, an issue, although it's easier to cross the street with 100 people and with three because <laughs> just sort of like, you know, the economy of scale. The National Park has been great. Uh, they've they've um, provided uh, at least one park ranger uh, to help with sort of the street crossings and, and the safety of the group. Um, so that's been very helpful. They use a portable loudspeaker system that that uh, nothing very elaborate just it's sort of like a headset with a, a thing that clips on your uh, your belt because uh, probably a lot like podcasting if the audio isn't good people aren't going to keep coming back um, and it, it's like as you plan the tour you have to think okay if it's real if it's 90 degrees and sunny is there a shady spot there i can have people stop and talk or uh, if it's drizzling, is there a place with overhead cover I can put them while we're walking? So, yeah, yeah there's a lot of logistics that goes into it. Sure. So what's what's been happening during the pandemic? And do you have any plans to open this up for the public again? Well, this year we had an extremely aggressive schedule because I had formally partnered with the National Park. And I think we had come up with something like 25 walks to do. It was almost like every Saturday from the beginning of March up through almost Thanksgiving it was going to be a different walk. And uh, we only were able to do one. Uh, the first one, it was on uh, women political leaders in Lowell. And, uh, and then things shut down after that. I've done a couple of virtual walks that if, if you go to the richardhow.com site and look for the Lowell Walks link, um, I've done a couple of uh, like of uh, Civil War Lowell uh, Lowell Cemetery, so there are 30 minute videos that people could um, participate in. And as for whether this will pick up again, I'm not sure. It, it's uh, I I think it's hard to predict where we're going to be um, two months or three months down the road from now. So. Uh, and it just because the walks attract so many people and they have to be in very close proximity to hear what's being said, um, I'd be hesitant to try to start them too quickly. But uh, as soon as whether it's be after a vaccine or after the virus magically disappears, whether it's uh, in the fall or next next year, uh, we'll definitely be back with a full schedule. So my uh, my last question to you before I open it up, because uh, Lou always has, has questions. You've been Register of Deeds in Lowell since 1995. To what do you attribute your political longevity? Uh, well, I think that uh, we've provided good service to uh, to the constituents that um, uh, if, if you, uh, I think the place runs well uh, very early on, because I understood technology, uh, we transferred every document we had, the earliest being from the year 1629 to our website. So again, that's on lowelldeeds.com is the website. So uh, you can research the history of your house. You can do title searches. You can ask for a copy of your deed. You can get a declaration of homestead and you can do all that virtually and, and back when the building was open to the public pre-pandemic, if you walked in and you needed some help, we put a real emphasis on in-person customer service. So I think uh, day after day, if you provide good service to the public, it, it uh, equates to support in, in the ballot box, particularly because 
I mean, the, the most controversial thing for a registered deed candidate, you know, what's that going to be, whether you use black ink or blue ink on the document? It's not like you have to take a position on the on the fiery issues of the day. So it's really about providing uh, good, reliable service to the public. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing I got from from reading you talking about your experience there is some of the stuff that was going on with technology in the blogosphere also related to the work you were doing at the Registry of Deeds. It was a different place when you came in there, right? It was, yeah. I think when uh, I think when I arrived, they had had a scanner for two months and they had 2,000 images, digital images, and um, we now have something like 14 million in digital images every single thing it's not only every single thing has been scanned we're on we're working on the third generation of images because as the technology improves we keep going back to the books and rescanning them or rephotographing them to get even uh, crisper better images so it's you're actually better off looking at the digital image than the original book because if you use the zoom feature of your on your computer it's like having a magnifying glass where you can zoom into a plan and catch the the details so yeah the technology has been um, terrific i i the, the kind of the the marker i use is that in 1999 uh, we needed 40 gigabytes of additional storage, and that cost $20,000. So <laughs> we could run out to CVS now and buy 40 gigabyte thumb drive for about eight bucks. <laughs> Lou, do you have any questions? Yeah, well, yeah, I have another subject I want to go to, but your last question, Doug, sparked something for me, uh, Richard, and and your answer sparked it for me. Why is the Register of Deed in an elected position? What am I missing about this that this needs to be that the person running this department has to be elected? Uh, well, the, it, it doesn't have to be. It, it's a matter of it's elected because it's a matter of history. And, and uh, I haven't completely figured it out, but I think <laughs> it's the English Civil War is the answer. Oh. Uh, and you asked, so I'll answer it. That's fine. <laughs> um, no, I'm interested. But, uh, so when... English first started coming here in the 1620s. There was a king, and he granted the people coming here um, ownership rights of the land. Uh, but then the king or his successor got his head chopped off, and somebody else took over, and all of that guy's pals got new grants for the land. And so they showed up, and there were all kinds of title disputes. And so the people here, I think, um, wanted to have better say on who owned what mm -hmm. and the registry of deeds system in america actually goes back to 1640 but i think it was in the 1680s 1690s is when it sort of be, became an independently elected position and, and i think that um, the the people who could vote at the time picked somebody who was fairly prominent in the community who was seen to be even-handed and uh who who could kind of prevent any shenanigans from occurring when it came to who owned uh, at least the land records. Um, so I think that's where it comes from. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just continued that way. All right. Let's go back to your discussion about the new technology and, uh, and society adapting to the new technology of, I'm guessing, social media. And I shouldn't be shocked, but I was kind of shocked you were talking about if I have the dates right, you started the blog in 2007 and there was no Facebook. Right, and it's hard for me to imagine that Facebook is that young, with with the Twitter and Facebook having the uh, share of our consciousness that they have. It's hard yeah. to believe they weren't around in two thousand seven. And, and I, I think there was Facebook at the time, but it was o it, you had to basically be in an Ivy League school, yeah, and be an undergraduate because I was in grad school around that time, and I could not join Facebook. Uh, but I worked in a gym, yep. and a lot of the undergrads at NYU, NYU students could get in, would tell me, oh, you have to try Facebook, which is better than Friendster, which was the thing. That, <laughs> right, exactly. Which, yeah. I don't know if you guys remember yeah. Friendster. That's what was on. So I could not, in 2007, get on to Facebook, but I think I think it existed in some form. Yeah, but not in a form. Right. Not in a form we know it now. And blogging is interesting, and I think this is, I think part of this um, adaptation that you talked about is we look at major media markets I think what we're seeing is the death throes of major media outlets because they're getting more volatile and they're getting more extreme and they're getting more incendiary and they're getting more biased as we go. And I think that's kind of the death throw of major news because we are all looking at each other for news and especially opinion. 
when you're doing a blog right now, you have to fight a few different things. First of all, you have to pull people away from the uh, campfire of Facebook and Twitter, which they don't want to do. You have to challenge their attention span, which they're not open to. And it's basically one direction. It's not like uh, interactive like Facebook is. You put a post up, people get to go back and forth on it. So I think blogging has to... I think blogging is one of the things that has to make the first major adaptation, doesn't it? It has to take these things into account. I was thinking as you were talking, my favorite blog, I hardly ever end up on the blog, I thought. And then as I'm thinking more and more, I'm thinking they put a Facebook post up. And one of the things they do, which is really great, is they put how long the read is. And they'll put a Facebook post up, and underneath it will say five-minute read. I go, okay, I can delve into that. And I end up on the blog reading it. So how does blogging have to adapt to the new reality of of accessible media, of social media. Well, once once um, Facebook and Twitter emerged as we know them now, um, I was delighted with them for for uh, primarily because um, I I was able to outsource the comments. Earlier in this conversation, I mentioned how I try to be moderate in the language I use. That's not the case with people who comment on blogs necessarily. And so, uh, but because it appeared on a site that carried my name, it was like, it didn't oh. matter who, who wrote it. If, if it appeared in print on that site, I was the one responsible for it. it right. was, I, I got blamed for it. You didn't moderate um, it. Well, and so I did. I, yeah. I mean, we still moderate our comments. So when you post a comment, it goes into a queue and I look it over and allow it. Now, unless it's like, uh, a real vicious personal attack or uses foul language, we, we let it up, even if I disagree with it. Uh, but that's been an ongoing concern. So by doing a blog post and then putting the link on Facebook, uh, it, Facebook actually became the platform for comments. Right. And that was, I, I thought that was great for a while. Now, what Facebook has become for me, it's it's sort of a delivery system for the blog is that uh, typically I'll do a blog post then I'll immediately post, uh, do it as a post on Facebook. And uh, a lot of people see it and they'll share it and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it can spread. Uh, my, my site is probably a little atypical and it's because it's not monetized. It's not a business. I don't have to be worried about how many eyeballs are looking at it because I don't have to answer to somebody who's paying me to, to promote their product on my site. Right. Um, it's just, uh, you know, that's, I put it out there. If anybody wants to read it, that's fine. And we get enough anecdotal feedback to know that there are some people reading it enough to at least to keep you doing it. And as that, that book points out, um, Part of it is we're in it for the long term, is that as a historian, if I go back and try to study what was going on in Lowell in, say, 1918 during the uh, Spanish flu epidemic, all I'm really left with is the, uh, the, the, the microfilm versions of the Lowell Sun because there weren't a lot of people leaving diaries or accounts of what was going on on a day-to-day right. -day basis. So... Uh, it's almost like it's like the book says history as it happens. This is like an installment version of a history of Lowell. Um, and so for that reason, I'm I'm happy to proceed independently. I do think I think people are going to start leaving social media. I think they already are. And I think they're recognizing the divisiveness that it creates. And, and they're starting to um, make a, a, a value decision that. You know, it, it, for all the benefits I get out of Facebook and my ability to stay connected with friends, I'm just going to spend less and less time on it. I'm not yeah. going to get my news from it. And so I think what's going to happen is it's almost going to be a, a, a potential to revive blogs. Um, I, I think the pendulum will swing back to these more local um, sites where you can where they build credibility among a smaller audience. And um, and so I think there'll be a resurgence of them. I also think it was interesting your post where you were talking about the uh, uh, red and gray corned beef. And I think even politically, blogs allow you and a personal brand allows you to explore some of these other things because I think what people are looking for is some kind of trust and relationship with the people giving them the information, even the political information. So, for example, I had this thing this week where a woman friend of mine had a post and she got a lot of blowback on it. 
Um, and it really kind of rattled her, and it's like, she's asking me, should I take it down? Should I not take it down? And he goes, it's a personal decision. If you don't want the grief, take it down, by all means. And it occurred to me that I can put posts up and get less grief on them than a lot of people because people know me. I've done shows. They know me from other things. They know my likes and dislikes. So it's more personal than someone speaking to them politically. So I think, I think blogs, I think it's good that you take on these things like literary and you take on, you know, red corn beef or gray corn beef because people want to know who you are when they're listening to your opinion. And I think that plays into it a lot more because social media makes it kind of anonymous. Someone's just putting a post on Facebook. You don't know their life. You don't know their history. You don't know their opinions otherwise, their value systems. You don't know whether you'd like them or not. And when that information is filled in, it makes it easier to listen to somebody else. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And I, I, in my mind, draw an analogy to bookstores. I'm old enough to remember when Barnes & Noble burst on the scene back. I think the first Barnes & Noble opened in Boston in 1976, maybe 1977. And the big bookstores like Barnes & Noble and Borders, they put out a business to small local bookstores. Well, then Amazon comes along and puts Barnes & Noble and Border out of business, even though Barnes & Noble is still hanging on. But now I think that there's a, a resurgence or at least a market or potential for a resurgence of small local bookstores who, which have adapted because just like with Low Walks, there's, there's great value to be had in the in-person experience, the, the kind of the reality of being there. As we were all experiencing during this pandemic, uh, doing everything virtually and at a distance comes with a price. Our, our lives seem a little less less uh, fulfilled. Um, and so I think in the same way that there's, uh, I think, potential for small independent bookstores to become more permanent, I think that there's a, a chance for a resurgence of these local um, news sites. Uh, I do think that we need to find a model that allows people to make a living doing it. Yeah. I think like I think newspapers, I, I think, were sound asleep at the switch when the Internet came along. And I, I think it, it's an example of people being wedded to a successful model that all of a sudden it wasn't going to be successful, but they weren't able to see that, um, you know, this, I think this is saying this, it, it's hard to get a guy to understand something when his uh, paycheck <laughs> right. relies on him not understanding it. Sure. And I think that's what happened to a lot of newspapers. Um, but if you kind of strip away all the... Uh, the heavy infrastructure costs, there might be a way to do it in, in a, a profitable way with a small, lean staff. And I mean, that's something you guys probably know more about than me. For example, talking to you now, we've never met before. And I, I'm imagining, I don't know this to be true, but I'm imagining we don't cross very much politically. But I will listen to what you write because I find you to be a reasonable individual and an even-keeled individual and thoughtful. So I'm going to be interested in your take on it, even though I'm probably not going to agree. And that's different from people, for example, if we're going to throw names around, uh, the globe. You know, I won't listen to the globe because I, I know I know what their personality is. And I know what their character is. And I know the reason behind what they're writing. You, I find I would find it very genuine and I'd go listen. So actually, this this raises a, a question for me. And you, you mentioned the sort of stuff we do. Merrimack Valley Magazine is locally owned. Um, do you see it as a problem that some of the major media outlets in our region are not owned by local people? Um, I, I, I do, but it, it, I don't think it's um, necessarily a problem. I think in practice it's a problem. I think, I, I think if, um, if a, a major media outlet is owned by a billionaire who's philanthropic and is providing the money and willing to maybe take a loss occasionally and keeps a hands off, um, I don't think that's a bad thing if it allows it to operate. If a major media outlet is owned by a hedge fund that's wedded to the bottom line and that, uh, uh, that reporters are laid off just so that it continue to make a profit, but even though it weakens the product, um, I think that is a problem. So I, I treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. Did yeah. you have any other questions? No, I Richard. That's it. Okay. I, well, enjoy, I enjoyed this. So yeah. so speaking of, yeah, this is great. Think, speaking of independent presses, uh, the book is out on 
Loom Press, and I recommend that if people want to pick it up, they go to loompress.com and order it off the website so that you're not ordering it off, uh, you know, like a bigger, um, um, you, you guys know what I'm talking about. So you're not getting it off Amazon. <laughs> um, you know, Paul will go and put this, uh, go to Amesbury Post Office and, and, uh, and put this in the mail for you the next day. So it's history as it happens. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, and thanks for all you guys do. Yeah, thank you very much. Next week on the show, we're going to have someone else who also knows quite a bit about Lowell history. Henry Marshan, who is a director of cultural affairs, he's retiring now uh, in Lowell, is going to come on and reflect about his, uh, his history and about the city and about its past. So thank you very much, everybody. It was really great, and I uh, hope everybody has a good week.